<laughs> All right, so before we do that, I do want to do the proof of the theorem here that if f is differentiable, notice I'm leaving out details of hypotheses. Um, so I'm not saying domains and ranges, I'm just being vague, but these typically are mapping some open set in Rn to Rn. Um, so if f is differentiable at A, then you can compute directional derivatives by applying the derivative matrix to the vector at hand. And we talked yesterday, we did several examples of how the if this condition fails for some v, you deduce what? That's not, not, not different. So that's actually a useful way to see a function is not differentiable. And, and the corollary of this, which is useful, is if f is differentiable, you can compute the derivative matrix the standard matrix of the derivative is the matrix of partial derivatives. Computed at the point. And as Matthew said, this is often referred to the Jacobian. Referred to as the Jacobian matrix of F. So how is that a corollary of the first thing? Is it because of the way we define the matrix multiplication? Because more basic, well, maybe the answer is yes. How did we actually define a standard matrix of a linear map? Uh, like this is what it does. Standard matrix. Yeah. Standard matrix. Right, so proof of corollary. The jth column of the standard matrix of a linear map, in particular this one, is what you get when you apply the linear map to the jth standard basis vector. But by this, what is the derivative applied to the j standard basis vector? And what is, by definition, the directional derivative in the direction of EJ? Partial. Partial. So if I put vector signs back on F here, this is the partial derivative of f, vector function, with respect to xj computed at a. And that's exactly what we're saying here. The jth column of this matrix is you take the partials of the various components of f with respect to xj. So the way to think about this is that the columns are gotten by taking the vector function f and differentiating it with respect to the j variable. Alternatively, you can think about it in terms of rows. And what are you doing then? You're taking a fixed component of f, the ith component of f, and thinking of its derivative matrix by taking its partials across there with respect to the various variables. You can think of it either way. So let's just do a quick example of that before I do the proof. So example, suppose f mapping r2 to r2 is given by f of uv is u cosine v u sine v. Does this ring a bell? Not yet? It's 
trying to, it looks like polar, polar coordinates here, right? This is R, this is theta, R cosine theta. Right? So if I put U and V in this picture, this is U here and this is V here, giving the coordinates X is given by U cosine V and Y is given by U sine V. We're going to come back to this example later this week several times. Mm -hmm. Is the, the partials matrix um, similar to what some of us may have learned about in previous multivariable courses that we called a gradient? We're getting there soon. Okay. Never mind. The gradient is just taking the derivative matrix and thinking of it as a vector, okay. transposing it. So we're, we're headed there. Um, but I wanted to illustrate what I was talking about here. So if I take what's df here at a point uv. So it's a two by two matrix. And you can think about either by taking component by component. So you can take the first component and differentiate it with respect to u and v. So what's the with respect to u? Cosine v. What's the with respect to v? Okay. Second component. What's the with respect to u? What's the with respect to v? U cosine v. Okay, so you can just compute the derivative matrix that way. But what I wanted to comment here is, suppose you look at this column. What you're doing is you're taking the derivative with respect to u of this function. You differentiate this vector function with respect to u, you get cosine v sine v. What is that geometrically? What does it mean to take the partial with respect to u. Here you are at a point, how do you take the partial with respect to u? Well, you fix v and vary u and take the derivative. Right, so I'm fixing v, varying u. What, what does that map to under this mapping? Fixing v, varying u. So you're fixing the angle and you're moving along the line at that angle, or the ray. If you take the derivative with respect to u, you should be finding the tangent vector to that path. Is that what this is? Well, it's a unit vector in the direction of the angle v, that's cosine v sine v. That's this vector. Let's do the other one. Fix u and vary v. That's a circle. Fix u and vary v. You're going around a circle with radius u. And you're looking at the tangent vector to that path. Right? So you take the derivative respect to v, you're differentiating as you move on this path and find the velocity vector. That's exactly this. So you can see the column vectors geometrically in the picture. The row vectors you don't see so much geometrically. Okay? So we'll be doing lots with that as we proceed the next few days. So I want to prove the proposition. So we are assuming f is differential. So what do we know then? We are, we are given that. Exists uh, t. OK, and I'm actually going to just write t as the derivative. Satisfying what condition? I'm going to not be putting vectors on my Fs. 
All over magnitude h. This limit is zero. Now, what are we interested in? We're interested in a directional derivative. We want the directional derivative at a in the direction of b. That's defined how. Do these things look like they might be related somehow? Yes. So we know this is true no matter how h comes into zero, that we can approximate the change in f by the derivative applied to h. And that'll be a good approximation. What are we interested in here? Are we in, when we come into the point A, are we interested in random directions of coming in? No, it's just the one trick. We're interested only in the direction of the vector v and what, come, what happens as we come in along that line. So what do you think I should do with this equation that I'm given in order to get some inference about this quantity. Fix a direction. Um, say again, Dan? Come in from a direction. Namely, uh, algebraically, what should I do? Put in blank equals blank. H equals TV. TV, TV H equals, H equals TV. TV. Yeah. So in star, Bingo. let's put H equal to TV. So, for, for, to say that this goes to zero is the equivalent to saying that what's going to zero? T. T. So the limit as T goes to zero of F of A plus T B minus F of A minus D F of A applied to the vector T B over Absolute value, well, all right, magnitude of TV. So this is known. And what you want to do is by crook or by hook, you want to get from this to this. So you have this, and you want to now see what it equals given that this holds. Hmm. So first thing we have to deal with, and then we switch boards, is what, 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 what is that? What's the magnitude of TV? Absolute value of T times magnitude of T. So this is fixed, but this is going to zero. So I'm going to rewrite that. And we have one bit of algebra to do, and then we're actually more or less there. So, we know, so rewriting star with h equal to tb put into it. We have limit f of a plus tb minus f of a minus df at a applied to tb over absolute value of t. And then there's a magnitude of v. How do I get rid of the magnitude of v here? This is a constant. Yeah, so we can multiply the whole thing. I can multiply the whole thing by that constant. 
And what do I get? I get 0 times that constant, which is? Still, still 0. Very good. Oh. So what this does is it allows me to get rid of the magnitude of V in the denominator. And I'm left with something that's looking closer and closer to what I want. Now you have to be slightly clever. Any ideas? Let's get rid of the D term, the D, the derivative of F of A. We can get rid of it. Oh, it's not there anymore. It looks just exactly as what we want. Oh, you mean if I, yeah. if my eye gets a blotch in the corner of it, I see what I want? No, but if we can prove that that <laughs> so is zero. You know, I that the other day that you can have constants. Yeah, the constant, you can take the T out. out. I can take the T out. Well, that's not what we proved the other day. That's by linearity. Oh, yeah. Which you can Right? So since df at A is a linear map, this can be rewritten. as limit t goes to 0, f of a plus tv minus f of a minus t, stop it forward, df at a, v, all over absolute value of t is 0. Yes, Matthias? Then can't you split it up into two different functions? And then once you split up into two different functions, if the individual limits exist, uh, okay. then I can split it up as a sum of limits. And so I got a problem here. It's not an absolute value. Yeah. I really don't like Mr. Absolute Value sitting there. Can you just stipulate that t is greater than zero? <laughs> You're on the right track. Only for each for each case, you can say it's negative t. We know this limit exists. And you can take t negative t times negative t. What's the limit as you approach with only positive numbers? Also it's still zero, right? Yeah. This is your favorite game from high school uh, calculus. <laughs> right? The li limits can be done from either side. So if the limit exists, both the left and the right hand limits are that limit. And vice versa, if the left and right hand limits both exist and are equal, that's what the limit is. That's your favorite game, which I don't particularly like, but it's sometimes important. So what happens if we only do positive t's? Well, then absolute value of t is t. And Matthias's idea was that then I have a t here and a t here, which cancel. So what does this limit have to equal? To the limit DFA. All right, but Which is do you see any t's appearing here? No. So I got rid of the t over t, right? Shall I put that step back in? I cheated, right? I skipped a step. Put t over t. You cheated. We're going to have to have a discussion about it. Discussion? Yeah. Honesty ah. about doing all your work. You're right. <laughs> so this is 1, and the limit goes away because this is constant as far as t is concerned. So I'm half done. I've got the right-hand limit of what I want is df at a, b. But what about when t approaches from the negatives? What's the difference if t is negative? What does it do here? It changes the sign. But then I, but then I have a negative. Where do I know this limit? So we only change the 
change the T on the denominator? Well, that's the only place I had absolute value of T. Oh, okay. Right? So absolute value of T when T is negative is negative T, right? Yeah. But what is this limit equal to? Negative. It's still zero. Zero. So I can multiply through by negative one, and now the limit without the negative sign is negative zero. This gets tiresome writing this all out. So I'm getting rid of the negative and saying it's over there, so I'm still zero. And now can I do the exact same thing we just did? Yes. Can I now just say this limit therefore equals this limit? Yes. So we're done, right? So So what do I got? I've got the left-hand limit is zero uh, is what I want. And I've got the right-hand limit is what I want. Okay. Therefore, do I not have what I wanted up there? I've got that the directional derivative is this limit without them coming in either way. It's the, just the limit. This limit is t goes to zero of blah. Is d f of a applied to b, and that's what I wanted. So if the function is differentiable, that long last directional derivative is gotten by evaluating the derivative. The book was not very efficient in its presentation. You should have a word with the author at some point. Um, this derivation was done, and a separate derivation was done with the EJs in there to do this first thing, but it's the same argument. So I'm not sure why it was done two separate ways. Perhaps the author had something in mind that I'm not thinking of. It happens. OK. So very useful, right? Because if only you had web works to do and it asked you to compute directional derivatives, you now could say, if I knew the function were differentiable, which you didn't know last week when you did web work, so you had to do stuff from the definition. But if you had a way of proving functions were actually differentiable, you could just hack out your derivative matrix, multiply by the vector v, and be done with it. It would be a lot easier than you were doing last week. So, wouldn't it be nice to have a convenient way to know functions of differential? So this is a rather important theorem. which introduces some new terminology which we will use for the rest of the course. And that is the following. Definition. We say F is script C zero. So you can practice your script C's if f is continuous. On whatever domain. I'm being vague about the domain. We say f is c1 if f is continuous and all its partial derivatives. Are 
continuous. Nothing about f being differentiable. Just compute partials and say they're continuous. And yeah, an f is just continuous. Does anyone have a conjecture about what happens as I change those numbers? Go down the line. Mm -hmm. Just keep going. Um, it's differentiable. It's C1. Say again? If it's C1, it's differentiable. Oh, well, okay. That's, yeah. But I was wondering what would happen if I put a 2 there. So we haven't talked about it yet, but we will next week at some point. You would take second derivatives, second partial derivatives, and you would say C2 means that second partial derivatives, second order partials which we'll talk about next week. So by the way, to say that the partial derivatives are continuous, in particular, I'm saying they exist at every point, and those are continuous functions. Fair enough? OK, and so as Taylor suggested, the theorem is going to be if f is c1, on, and I'm just going to say an open set here. Then f is differentiable. So why is this convenient? Well, this is convenient because you can look at formulas like e to the x and e to the xy sine x cubed plus y cubed. And you can see that you know how to take partial derivatives of those things and they're continuous functions because you know exponentials are continuous and polynomials are continuous and sines and cosines are. So all the building block functions are going to fit into this very conveniently and you're going to know that you can take derivatives of them without any problems and that those derivatives will be continuous. So this will tell you that nice functions are continuous. The differentiable, hence differentiable. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you distinguish between the partials being continuous and it being differentiable if they're equivalent for this, for this definition? No, because this is a real theorem. So I'm saying you can very easily, in a lot of cases, check that the partials exist, you can write down a formula, and you can say, oh, that's a continuous function. Therefore, I deduce the function's differentiable, and I don't have to try to prove that it's differentiable from the definition. So you're going to apply this theorem all the time without even saying it. Oh, oops, I, sorry, I thought that was an infinite over here. My bad. Ah, well, now that you brought that up, is it true? Good question, Tony. Question. Is the converse true? So go back to baby calculus and the, 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 the peanut gallery of people that took the calc theory have an advantage here. If you have a function from R to R that is differentiable, is it necessarily C1. Tony, you should know this example also. So I'm, this is old-fashioned stuff, nothing newfangled with, but if you had f prime, if you had a derivative at every point for a function of mod r, does that derivative have to be continuous? If f prime exists everywhere, must f prime be continuous. Now students often, you, you wouldn't dare do this because you're a sophisticated crowd here, but students often say, well, differential implies continuous, so of course. What am I saying here? I'm asking, well, no partials here. This is just single variable calculus. 
is the derivative, if it exists, necessarily a continuous function? Yeah. As long as it's differential. No. That's just a second differential. I'm not talking about twice differential. If f is differentiable, is the derivative always a continuous function? No. No. F is continuous. No, F is continuous. F is continuous. You're enjoying this. <laughs> now, what's particularly puzzling about this is that you may have heard a theorem back from your calculus teacher, it's in calculus, certain calculus books, that the derivative of any differentiable function, the derivative always has the immediate value property. It can, the derivative cannot jump. But is that saying that the derivative has to be continuous? Matthias, did you have a? It's, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> what if I don't, what if f of x equal natural log of x? Then the derivative is 1 over x, right? That's but that's continuous wherever it's defined. So on the domain, oh. right? Remember, continuous means continuous on the domain. Would, um, wouldn't the function y equals the cube root of x be? It's not differentiable at zero. What's okay. that like? Right? That is not differential. Cube root function is not differentiable at zero. Okay, but it's just nice Okay. So peanut gallery, do you know the answer? Yeah, I wish I could answer. You guys? <laughs> Dan's being very quiet. Uh, All of a sudden, uh, Rebecca, are you going to jump into the fray? No. No. <laughs> we just want to have like a hole and then we can just. I can tell. Why equals x squared? What about it? <laughs> <laughs> like, it becomes positive. It's like. But 2x two, but two is continuous. All oh, right, yeah. However, I'll take your x squared and raise it. What? X my collar. Oh, I That's totally that's the one that gets of course it is. <laughs> it zero, but it never actually gets So, zero. what is this function doing? <laughs> What's sine 1 over x doing? It's taking all the oscillations of the sine functions go to infinity and it's jamming almost all of them up right next to zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what this function does is it does something like this and then it oscillates faster and faster and faster and faster. And then it does the <laughs> negative of that coming this way. So this is sine of 1 over x approximately with some artist leeway here. <laughs> What does the effect of the x squared do? It scrunches. It keeps it up. It keeps it up. It keeps it up. It damps it, right? So you have the x squared, which now governs the amplitude of the oscillation. You guys have played this game in pre-calculus or somewhere in your prior lives. So you have this x squared curve that then damps this down so that Yes, it makes stuff bigger as I go out here, but as I get close to zero, all this squiggling gets compressed so that it's going less and less high here. Do you think that function has a derivative at zero? Yes. What is it? Zero. zero. So, <laughs> so this is not hard to check directly from the definition. F prime of zero is the limit of F of H minus F of zero over H. That is the limit 
h squared sine 1 over h minus 0 over h. Doing the hard algebra here, and h cancels. And this is the kind of stuff you've been doing in homework now for a couple weeks. This stuff is bounded by 1. h is going to 0. So, what, what is the limit? Zero. But Jonathan's geometric intuition based on thinking about secant lines from the origin having to be approaching zero slope because you're squished under the parabola and above the lower parabola is exactly right there. All right, but now you guys are good at calculus. When x isn't zero, tell me the derivative of that formula. 2x sine 1 over x plus x squared minus product rule. What's the derivative of sine of 1 over x? Uh oh, we had to use the chain rule too. Oh, unfair. How about the So what have I got? The x squareds cancel, right? So what happens as x approaches zero? Well, this goes to zero by the argument we just made, right? This, the x damps this out. But what does this do? It just doesn't like it. It just oscillates more and more and more. Between negative one and one. No limit. So the function has a derivative everywhere, including zero, but the derivative is not continuous. This is a super common counterexample that shows up in mathematics a lot. So some of you have seen this. It's not the crux of the matter for this kind of course, but I did want to, since, especially since Tony led me into this, I felt like we had to discuss this. You can see pictures in the book of this graph, too. All right. So we are not saying if and only if. But having continuous partial derivatives is enough to imply differentiable. And the key ingredient, as I already told you at the beginning of class, the key ingredient in the proof of the theorem is everybody's favorite theorem from baby calculus. Bribe to people that can actually tell me what the theorem says. Yeah, you, yeah, you don't get to do this. So you have a function on an interval, closed interval. It has some hypotheses or other. What are the hypotheses? Maybe something it's like continuous. It continuous. Is. And blah, blah, blah. Hold on. And what else do I need? Well, uh, okay. Differentiable on the open on the open interval. A B. Then there exists a C between A. There exists a C between A and B. No, no. Wrong so theorem. Yeah, no. She got. It. Oh, it's this. It's the slope of this. A plus B over two. No. No. It's the slope of C. It's the slope of C. But there's some points where the f plus c minus f minus a equals at least one from c. Should mention that. So look at the slope of the secant line joining the endpoints of the graph. And the theorem says 
that there's at least one point in the interval where the derivative matches that slope. Now, we're going to do a multivariable version of this next semester as well. The point is not that there's a C where this is true and that you should find the C. <laughs> Even those insipid calculus books give exercises like that. <laughs> the point of this is that if you have information about the derivative, for example, you know the derivative is always at least 20, then that tells you global information about what must be true about the function. So if you know the derivative is always at least 20, if you know, if you know that on a certain trip you always were going over 20 miles an hour, then you know that in an hour you must have gone over 20 miles. Gone over 20 miles. And vice versa, this is how the cops on the New Jersey Turnpike can give you speeding tickets. Because you pull into the place and you get your little ticket, and then you leave the turnpike an hour later, and it turns out in that hour you've gone 85 miles. Then the cop says, hey, wait a minute, you averaged 85 miles an hour, therefore at some moment you must have exceeded the speed limit. Ticket. Did they do that? Yes. Well, they just about with me. New Jersey Turnpike is known to be All right. So I emphasize that the point here is going to be that info on the derivative gives control on the function. Now we're actually going to use this exact statement to prove our theorem. But in general, we're not going to really care so much about where the C is other than that it just exists. Alright, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get started on the proof of the theorem. And I may run a couple minutes over. just to save you from having to come back and pick up at the middle of it tomorrow. So we can get on to new stuff. So the so proof of the theorem is, 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 a, is a picture that you should remember. And then the rest of it is just bookkeeping. Do we have any, do we have any good bookkeepers here? We've lost all our Terry mm -hmm. College people. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here's the idea. To do differentiable, I'm supposed to show that some limit is zero, right? Goal, I'm going to do this, by the way, just in two dimensions. And I'm going to say the, the same idea generalizes. I'm going to be at a point A. I'm going to go to a nearby point A plus H, and I'm going to want to prove that if I take the change in the function and subtract the best linear approximation coming from the derivative, that that is small compared to h. So the key thing, and if you remember this picture, it will get you quite far, is to think about how do I want to compute the change in f. All I know about is partial derivatives. So we know that the partial derivatives are continuous. That's all I know. Well, let's think about this. Partial derivative means I'm figuring out how f varies when I do what? x varies. Let x vary. Or what? Fixing. Y. And y varies. y varies, fixing x. So can you think of a root? Hint, it's not on the New Jersey Turnpike. Can you think of a root from a to a plus h where I travel varying only x, fixing y? Or I travel varying only y, fixing x. 
How about we go in the x direction for a while, and then stop just in time to go in the y direction for just a while. So if, as usual, I write A as AB and H as HK, as you are now getting used to my doing, I'm going from the point AB here to what point here in the middle? A plus H. A plus H, E. And then I'm varying Y from there. So instead of taking a direct path, I'm taking a convenient two-step path. And you'll see this next semester when we're doing line integrals as well, that we'll do this kind of trick. So the key thing is that f of a plus h minus f of a can be broken into two pieces, which I'm going to color code for you. I'm going to do the first piece, f of a plus h b minus f of a b. So this is the blue, this is the yellow piece. And then I'm going to add the change on the blue path, where I go from a plus h b to the final point. the algebraically minded people in the audience will observe that I did what? To get from this equation that had two things in it to this equation that had four things in it, what did I do? I added the clever zero. I added and subtracted this quantity. And then I broke it into the two pieces. Now, you say to yourself, <coughs> On the yellow path, I have a function just of x. And I'm interested in how much the function changed as I went from this value a to this value a plus h. Sounds like mean value theorem. The change in the function is given by the derivative somewhere on the interval times the length of the interval. So this yellow creature becomes the partial derivative somewhere in the interval. Now, b is fixed, but x is varying. So there's some point squiggle, otherwise known as squiggle. So squiggle here is between a and a plus h. I can compute the derivative at some point and then multiply by the change in x. Right, that's the denominator. What's the change in x on that interval? H. And that's a way of writing the change on the yellow path. Similarly, what's the change on the blue path? Now I'm varying y, fixing x. So what's this equal to? H is steady and then you got some other Partial of f with respect to y. y at a plus h. The a plus h is not changing. Plus some. But now the y has to be at some point. So my first thing, the squiggle put me at a point there. And the, on this path, different I need a different squiggle. Mm -hmm. So I'll call it eta. Give you something that isn't that hard to write. And then I multiply the derivative by the change in y. Well, I went from b to b plus k, so the change is k. Okay. And this is for some eta between b and b plus k. Okay. So this is the main idea. Breaking the change up into these two pieces. And now we just have a little bit left, and then we're done. So I split the green thing up into two pieces. And I swear I did not plan this. But all you art people in the room 
know that if you put blue and yellow together. Anyone that has those good, oh, yeah, really good one. You have to learn to find these things. Apparently, you don't. What color do you get when you mix those two? All right, so, so what do we have when we do f at a plus h minus f at a minus the derivative? Well, the derivative is this times the vector hk. So I'm going I'm to split this into two pieces, and guess what? What? <laughs> <laughs> this piece is going to be in yellow, and this piece is going to be in blue. So my yellow piece over there was the so the. So the yellow part of this becomes this, right? So I've split f of a plus h minus f of a into yellow plus blue, and this is the yellow part, and this is the blue part. So I'm, I've got the yellow part here, so this is, this is all in yellow, and then I've got the blue part. The blue part is partial respect to y at a plus h eta times k. And now I'm going to put in the, this stuff in, inside my brackets. So I have the partial respect to x at a times h. And here I have the partial respect to y at a times k. Are you seeing the punchline showing up? What am I going to do with the H's and the K's? Yeah, take them out. Can't I factor them out? Yeah. So I'm going to have the partial respect to X at squiggle B minus partial respect to X at the point A vector. And then I'm going to have similar stuff with y partials. Times k. What do we know is happening as the vector h shrinks? As the vector h shrinks, what is happening to this point? It's coming into a. So what are happening? What's happening to these points? So as this shrinks down, those shrink over to A as well. So what's happening to this stuff? I guess I should continue my color coding. What's happening to this stuff as vector H goes to zero? What do we know about the function partial with respect to x? We finally get to use the hypothesis of the theorem, which is erased. <laughs> what are we assuming about the partials? They're continuous. Continuous. So what happens is this point approaches this point. It goes to zero. This goes to zero. What happens as this point goes to this point? Zero. This goes to zero. Well, so the last step is, what were we supposed to do? We were supposed to look at this difference and ask, does it go to zero faster than magnitude h? We're supposed to divide by magnitude h. So the stuff over magnitude h breaks into the yellow piece plus times h over magnitude of vector h plus the blue piece times k over magnitude of 
vector h. This stuff's going to zero. What can you tell me about these pieces? If you add them, they're let's hope. No, no, no. What, what do you, can you tell me about these pieces? Bounded by one. The absolute values are bounded by one. So what happens if you take something whose absolute value is bounded by one and you multiply it by something that goes to zero? And another one. And add them. Zero. And the proof. Quick question and we'll quit. Couldn't you alternatively prove that like the yellow part is actually bounded by zero and h, and then it's like h squared, and the other part is bounded by zero and k, and it's h squared plus k squared, and then like divided by h the square root of h squared plus k squared? But where did the h squared come from? Well, because the yellow part is so that it's like that part is bounded is basically like um, because you know that squiggle has to be between a be between right, a. Right. So this is. This is something that we know goes to zero as h goes to zero. Right. But you don't know necessarily that it's of the size of h, but you know so it's. But it's less than h. So like that would be less than h squared. Mm, not quite. It might be less than h to the one half or h to the one third or something. You don't actually know what you're saying. Okay. You just know it <laughs> goes to zero. You just know it goes to zero as next to h. Your intuition is correct, but it's not exactly correct. Mathematically, <laughs> it is. Okay.